continuing with newton's laws of motion today last time we have discussed extensively about pseudo force and application of the concept of pseudo force in non inertial frame and related free body diagrams etc and in general we have completed most of the aspects of uh, newton's laws of motion but still uh, we'll discuss more types of questions and today's session we'll also start with with the uh, concept of the spring force or the kind of uh, interactive force that a spring applies on a body or so let's let's understand the working of springs and the type of force they apply so a spring as you know is uh, you know made of metallic wire it's made of thin metallic wire which is coiled into the shape of or is wound into the shape of a coil like this it's a thin metallic wire okay, which is wound into a coil shape now as a result of that winding and also a result of the so called elastic property of the metal with which the wire is made the metallic wire frame uh, as a result of that elasticity of that metal the spring has a property that it applies tends to apply a restorative force when either compressed or extended so if this is what we call the natural length of the spring that is the length when it is in a relaxed state that is no external forces are acting on it now compared to that if we compress a spring by pushing it with external forces which are you know acting inwards like this then it develops an internal restorative force which is like a tension so we'll call it t so when the spring is in a compressed state applies a restorative force you can also call it we can also call tension t so this tension or restorative force acts outwards
Okay, similarly, when the spring is alternately extended also, it applies, it tends to apply a restorative force. So instead of this, if the spring is pulled outwards, such that it's in an extended state, now the spring is in an extended state. So in this case, it's being pulled outwards with some external force, but the spring itself applies an inward restorative force. So, it, so the spring develops a restorative force or tension. Okay, now this is inwards in direction. Okay. So basically the idea is like this, when the spring is in natural state or what we call relaxed state, there is no tension or restorative force. Because it's in a relaxed state. But compared to this, when it's in either a compressed state or an extended state, the spring develops so here it's extended, here it is compressed. So to bring it into the compressed state, we have to apply externally force like this. And the spring internally develops a restorative force, which is outwards extension like this. Okay. To bring it to this kind of state, we have to apply external force outwards. And the spring internally develops an inward restorative force or inward tension. like this. So both of these are what we call deformed states. This is the relaxed state. This is a deformed state in which in this case, the deformity is in the form of a compression. So compression involves an outward restorative force that the spring develops. In this case, the deformity is in the form of an extension. When the spring is extended, it develops an inward restorative or tension force.
okay so now about the restorative force supplied by the spring an ideal spring okay has two important properties it is massless that is the mass of the spring is negligible and secondly it applies restorative force or tension according to a principle called hooke's law okay so this principle of hooke's law is that the restorative force is proportionate in magnitude to the amount of extension of com or compression okay it is proportional to the amount of compression or extension so the tension or restorative force becomes equal to a particular constant called the spring constant multiplied by the extension or compression so here t is the tension or restorative force okay and x is the amount of extension or compression and the quantity k is called the spring constant the spring constant or it is also called the stiffness coefficient okay or sometimes it's sim simply called the stiffness of the given spring So note this down first, then I'll take you uh, to the earliest part once more. If you missed out anything that you're writing down, but first note down this principle of Hooke's law. This this particular principle it is called Hooke's law. So an ideal spring obeys Hooke's law, and it has the other important property that its mass is negligible.
No, so says the thing is no, the mass of the spring is not zero. So that's what I meant by saying that when we say massless, it basically means that the mass of the spring is negligible. So you know you might be in a situation where you are using a spring of mass of few grams to suspend a block of mass of several kgs. So compared to the mass of the block or the other elements in your system, the mass of the spring becomes negligible. That is the condition for an ideal spring. Okay. So there are all types of springs actually. There will be springs whose mass is in the range of few grams. There are springs whose mass is much heavier. For example, if you see, you know, a small spring which is in a mechanical device like a ballpoint pen or something like that, its mass will be not even few grams. It's very negligible. At the same time, you see heavier springs or heavier gauge springs in heavy machinery like the coil springs uh, in, in automobiles, etc. In the suspension of automobiles, if you look at a coil spring or something like that, its mass is much heavier. But at the same time, the mass of the spring is still very small compared to the mass of the automobile no? whose suspension is balancing. So in general, the spring is such a device whose own mass is negligible compared to the amount of load it's balancing. So that is what we mean by saying that it is of negligible mass. So you are correct in saying that its, it's mass is not zero. But the thing is that its own mass is negligible compared to uh, the mass of the other parts of our system. So when we say massless is just a figure of speech, what we actually mean is that it's of negligible mass. Okay, so let's come back to the concept of the spring constant. So the spring constant itself, this is a physical quantity of a particular spring. Spring constant. It's expressed in Newtons per meter which will be the SI unit. Okay, now this spring constant is a physical property of a spring, which depends on various things, which depends on various factors like the metal used to construct it, okay. the thickness or what we call the gauge, of the metal wire, okay. the radius of the winding of its coil. the density of the number of tons per unit length, etc. It depends on all these factors. Okay. But we will treat it like an empirical coefficient. Okay. So we will treat it like an experimentally determined constant. Okay, so we'll just treat it like K is given from the data in a situation. So there's no particular formula for the spring constant. We have to just assume that it is a physical constant that we determine from experimental data in a given situation.
Okay, so for example, suppose we have a situation like this that we are using a spring attached by a hook to a vertical ceiling. We are using it to suspend a block of a given mass. So given that the mass of the block is say 20 kilograms okay, and the spring is of negligible mass and spring constant equal to let us say 50 Newton per centimeter. So first thing is find the tension developed in the spring if the block is at rest in its equilibrium state. Okay, so equilibrium means that the net force on the block is zero. And second, find the extension x in the spring's length. In this situation, we have to work out these two things. So what we understand in this is that because of the weight of the block, what is happening is it's the block is pulling the spring down. Okay. So the block is being pulled down by its gravitational force. So that is stretching the spring out. So its length is extended. And as a result, the spring is developing an internal tension, which is like this. Okay. And the tension also acts on the hook on the wall. Okay. So that creates like a reactionary force R over here. So if you look at the free body diagram of the spring, you see that it is being pulled down with tension and with reactionary force here. And the spring itself is applying an inward tension. And that tension is equal to Kx. So that R over here is the reaction force at the hook. Okay. And T is the tension or restorative force developed in the spring. So this is the state of the spring. Now, if you look at the state of the block that is below it, the block is at rest. So what is happening is this is equal to mg. This is the force with which the block pulls down the end of the spring. Okay. That P is equal to its weight because when you look at the free body diagram of the block, you realize that the block is experiencing this tension, which is balancing its weight because its acceleration is zero. That's why we have this. The acceleration of the block is zero. Okay. So first of all, the restorative force in the spring or the tension is equal to the weight of the block. that is equal to how much take g as 10 meters per second square so that is 200 newtons so this is the restorative force in the spring okay. 
that will do kx sometimes we just call this the spring force only instead of restorative force or tension we just call it the spring force so because the spring is stretched the direction of the spring force is inwards just complete this question now the second part in the extension in the length of the spring x we have to calculate so for that the spring constant is given to us is 15 newtons per centimeter so just move that out now
Yeah, I'll scroll up first, but uh, the answer is four centimeters. Yes, that's correct. So the second part of the question, we have to find the extension in the spring. So that's just formula based now. We have to find out X. So you have this equation here. Just use this. And in this equation, K is given to us to be 50 newtons per centimeter. That was given. So X, KX is equal to MG. So X will become equal to mg by K. So that is 200 newtons divided by 50 newtons per centimeter. So we need not convert to SI unit also. We can just keep it in this hybrid units, newton per centimeter. So you should understand that 50 newtons per centimeter is actually the same thing as 50 into 10 raised power 2 newtons per meter. Because you know, 50 newtons divided by 1 centimeter is 50 newtons divided by 10 days per minus 2 meters so it is 50 into 10 days power 2 newtons per meter but here we need not convert we can just keep it this way because then we'll get x in centimeters we'll get x as 4 centimeters so that is the extension of the spring this is the extension of the spring so hope this calculation is clear to all of you. Just make a note of this and we'll look at some more examples. So also after this, we'll be doing some questions from HC Verma exercise of Newton's laws of motion. So if you have any doubts or any questions that you want to discuss from HC Verma in particular, you can send it to me in the text message. I will discuss those questions in detail. Now in a position to complete the exercise problems of HC Verma and then move on to the next section which will be friction. So which is the part you wanted to note down again Hush? This was, uh, yeah you can send on WhatsApp also but you can send on either the text message here or WhatsApp whichever. Yeah which is the part you want to note down again this uh, this, this section has or above this this part okay okay finish writing this down then. and send me any questions you have for doubts i'll do a couple of more questions on springs then we'll come to your doubts Yeah, Arshita, I'll scroll down again. First, uh, students are writing down this section. So when they finish, I'll, I'll take you to the question and its solution again. Okay, so Harsh, are you done with this section?
Okay, so let's understand another example question. So here we have uh, now this kind of situation. We have an ideal spring which is connected to a massless thread and on the other side the thread is connected to a block like this. Now, the given data in the question is that the mass of the block is 50 kilograms. Acceleration due to gravity is 10 meters per second square. And when the block is in equilibrium, okay, the extension of the spring is found to be let's say four centimeters so first thing find the value of the spring constant and secondly find the acceleration of the block at an instant when the extension x is equal to 2 centimeters instead of 4 centimeters if the extension of the spring is 2 centimeters then how much should be the acceleration of the block so this is a massless thread which we joined with an ideal spring. And this is a fixed smooth pulley and all that. Rest of the things are standard. So you have to just calculate over here these two things. So just try out this question.
वॉट इज द यूनिट जय वॉट इज द यूनिट ऑफ द स्प्रिंग कॉन्स्टेंट यू गिवेन यू आंसर इज करेक्ट प्रोवाइडेड यू नो द करेक्ट दैट्स गुड दैट्स करेक्ट नाउ कम टू द सेकेंड पार्ट Okay, so let's understand this. So what is happening is at for the first part, it is given to us that when the spring is in a state where it is having an extension of 
four centimeters. At that point of time, the block is in equilibrium. For this value, the block is in equilibrium. So that means at this point of time, the restorative force of the spring equals to this tension. Let's say T1. So Kx1 is equal to T1, equal to mg. So X1 is, or K is equal to, mg by x1. So that is so 125 Newton per centimeter is the spring constant. But in the second part, yes, that's correct. So this is the same thing as saying that k is equal to newtons per meter. So that's also a correct answer. You can write it like this also. Both are correct. Okay. Now for the second part, what is happening now is that in a different situation, the extension of the ring is now only 2 centimeters. So in this situation, the tension will be different uh, compared to the above situation. So the block will have some kind of acceleration. So that's what we have to find out. So here, the spring force is becoming less. So accordingly, the tension in the thread is also becoming less. So the tension is becoming less. That means at this point of time, the weight must be okay because x2 is less than x1. It means t2 is less than t1. Therefore, the block accelerates downwards. So now you have to just find out the acceleration.
<coughs> okay, so any, <coughs> anybody else got the answer for the uh, second part? Clamp is a device that is used to hold a, hold something uh, like a hook or like a pulley is attached at its axle to a clamp. So it is like a pin or you know a hook which is used to hold an object to a surface. I'll explain in that particular question. Don't worry. Let's complete this one first. Okay, so here what is happening? See the tension T2 is equal to Kx2 now. Now K we have already seen is 125 newtons per centimeter or 12,500 newtons per meter, whatever. Okay. And X2 is given to us as two centimeters now at that instant. So the tension in the string becomes 125 into two. It becomes 250 newtons. So now you look at the free body diagram from the block. So its weight is 500 newtons, but the tension is only 250 newtons. The mass of the block is 50 kg. So its acceleration is like this. as a downward acceleration of 5 meters per second. So as it goes down, the spring will continue to stretch. And as the spring continues to stretch, this acceleration will become lesser and lesser you know, because the tension is increasing in the spring. So by the time the extension of the spring changes from x2 equal to 2 centimeters, it's having an acceleration of whatever, 5 meters per second squared downwards. By the time this stretches further to x1 equal to 4 centimeters, the acceleration would have become zero because the tension would have increased to 500 newtons. So, hope this is clear to all of you. Now I'm moving on to some of the questions from the HC Verma exercise. So I'm starting with uh, question number six. Which I've received as a doubt from somebody. So in that what is happening is that the X, uh, sorry, the velocity versus time graph is given to us for a certain body. Time in seconds. So this velocity versus time graph happens to be this kind of a shape. Okay, so it starts from rest at t equal to zero, as you can see, and the velocity increases to 15 meters per second at a time of three seconds. Kind of thing is given. Okay. 
then it's given that it's constant till it's five seconds. And then again, by the time it's eight seconds, the velocity reduces to zero. So it says that a particle of mass 50 grams okay, undergoes straight line motion. with B versus T as shown. So we have to find the net force acting on it at various instants of time. Find the force or the net force on it at T equal to two seconds, T equal to four seconds, and then again at T equal to six seconds. This is a very simple question, which is just about the basic application of Newton's second law. This question, we have to just use the concept that the net force is equal to mass into acceleration. So we have to find the acceleration. How to find acceleration from velocity time graph? Okay. Acceleration is instantaneous velocity, rate of change of velocity with respect to time. No? So this is nothing but the slope of the tangent okay. in the in the velocity in the velocity time graph there is nothing but slope of tangent of v versus t the acceleration okay so at t equal to 2 seconds you can see that you are part of this graph so this slope is how much so at t equal to two seconds you can see the acceleration is we can equate this with delta v by delta t because it is a straight line so slope of the straight line is like this so you can see that it is 15 minus 0 upon 3 minus 0 So it is 5 meters per second square. So therefore, force will become this mass so 15 to 10 base power minus 3 multiplied with this acceleration, 5. So 2.5 into 10 base power minus 1 newtons or 0 0.25 newtons, that will be the force. Okay. Now, likewise, for this part, at 4 seconds, you can see that the acceleration is 0 because V is constant. So, at 4 seconds, the acceleration will be 0. So, net force will be 0. At this time, we saw that the acceleration was plus 5 meters per second squared. Now, at this time, 6 seconds, you can again see that the acceleration will become minus 15 by 3. So that is minus 5 meters per second square. So there's a deceleration. Okay. So the magnitude of the net force will be the same. But it will be in it will be a retarding force. it is opposite to velocity and this is at this time the force that we are getting it's an accelerating force So hope this question is clear. Make a note of it, please. And next, we'll move on to question number 10 after this. So go through this and then go through question number 10. We will discuss.
Actually, we'll also go through question number eight. Okay. We'll go through question number eight and then question number ten. Okay, next up, let's uh, come to question number eight, people. So it says that um, you have like spherical raindrops, which are of certain mass given. Four milligrams. So that is four into ten raised power minus six kgs. And uh, radius equal to one millimeter. So again, that is ten raised power minus three meters. Okay. Now these are falling. with a certain velocity v not equal to 30 meters per second as they are just about to hit the surface of a bald person's head okay, so let's say just about to hit the head of the bald person Now it's also given that by that time the raindrop comes to rest what happens is that it has traveled a distance of equal to its radius against the so it will kind of squash no, against the bald head so by the time it comes to rest what is happening is on the on the surface the water has traveled a displacement which roughly equals to from its initial state when it was moving with a velocity v0 to its final state where its velocity is zero it has traveled a displacement equal to the radius or one millimeter so we have to find out that during this time when it was against this what is the average force that the surface is applied on it it's average force okay so the average force will be equal to m into average deceleration where a will be the average deceleration 
so for that we can use the fact that initial velocity was v not final velocity is zero and the displacement is equal to s so v square is equal to u square minus 2as so in this case it is 30 square upon 2 into 10 raised power minus 3 so it is 9 by 2 into 10 raised power 2 plus 3 so that's 5 meters per second square so this is the average deceleration so from that now we'll get the average force as mass into this average deceleration so the mass is this much 4 into 10 raised power minus 6 kg multiplied by the average deceleration which is 9 by 2 into 10 raised power 5 meters per second square so this becomes 1.8 newtons this becomes the average force so hope this is clear i'll come to the 10th question after this we'll discuss Okay, so let's take a look at the 10th question. <clears throat> so the situation shown over here is like this. We have a block which we placed on a smooth horizontal surface. But the block is also connected to two springs. Now in the given diagram, it's assumed that both the springs are at their relaxed state. So 
so this spring has a constant k1 this has a constant k2 this is a smooth surface now over here both of these are at natural length this one has its is it's at its own natural length this one is at its own natural length now it's saying that if we displace the block from this given position to x on either side what will be the acceleration of the block so right now you can see in the above diagram the acceleration is zero because both the springs are having zero tension but if i displace it by x like this so now the block is somewhere here so what has happened is that this spring this has got stretched this is become l1 plus x and this spring here is got compressed so its length has become l2 minus x because we displaced the block by x like this from here to here so what will happen is that this will apply an inward tension so that is k1 x1 and this will apply an outward tension okay so on the block's free body diagram you can see both the springs are applying force in the same direction this one is from the first spring and this one is from the second spring So the block will have an acceleration like this. There's no friction, so vertical forces you need not show. They are just balancing each other. So K1 X1, sorry K1 X. My mistake. These are these are all the same value of X. The difference is the first spring is extended. the second spring is compressed but the amount of compression or the amount of extension is the same so k1x plus k2x this is a net force this is equal to mass into acceleration so the acceleration of the block will become k1 plus k2 into x divided by m okay. and you will understand that the direction of e will be opposite to the direction of x okay so you can see that when we displace the block in this direction okay the forces were like this okay so the acceleration became in the opposite direction but similarly if we displace the block in this direction now then what will happen is that this spring will get compressed so this will apply a force like this the other spring will get extended so it will apply a force like this so it has the same magnitude of acceleration but opposite the direction so you can see that whether you take it to the right side or the left side the direction of acceleration is always going to be the opposite to the direction of extension or the direction of the displacement so hope this question is clear we'll take a look at question 11 next 11 is a fairly simple question just make the free body diagrams of a and b and you will get the answer so just give it a try and i'll put up the fpds in a moment
Okay, let's look at the eleventh uh, question. As I said, very simple free body diagram. So what you have to understand is that when you are applying the force on the block A, the block B will not have a tendency to move it you know, because there is no friction between A and B. So directly you are not applying any force on B. You understanding? Directly you are only applying force on A, and therefore only A will accelerate. B will just remain where it is. Still, of course. A slides from underneath, and B falls over. So when we apply a force like this, this is what's going to happen. This is a smooth surface. This is also smooth. So what will happen is this will slide from underneath, but this will remain at rest because you look at B's free body diagram. The forces acting on it are only its weight and normal reaction, and they balance each other. There is no acceleration. There is nothing to create acceleration. But you look at E's free body diagram. On E's free body diagram, B is applying a downward normal reaction like this. E has its own weight like this. There is normal reaction that the ground is applying. But most importantly, there is this force. And this force gives it a horizontal acceleration e. So F will be equal to mass of A into E, and N B plus this weight will balance with this normal reaction. Okay. So acceleration of the block E will become F upon M A, and the normal reaction will become. Normal reaction with the ground will become the combined. So this is what we have to do in eleventh question. Okay. okay next, I'm going to come to. A question sent by Harshita. So this is not from HCB, but I'll just explain the question. So here, what is happening is says that a pebble or a stone or whatever is thrown vertically upwards from the ground level. So let's say the mass of the stone is m, and you throw it like this. So it's on its way up, like this. So as it's going up at some point of time, and then after some time, it's on its way down. So we have to find the net force and the direction of the net force during the upward journey, during the downward journey, at the highest point. Okay. And secondly, if the stone was instead thrown at A projection angle of 45 degrees. In that case, again, we have to answer all these questions. So the thing is, you, know, you realize that it's all about free body diagram. The only force acting on the stone at all these points of time, even when it's at the highest point, its velocity is zero. The only force acting on it is mg, vertically downwards, always. So it doesn't matter what the velocity of the stone is. Every once it is in motion, that is, it's lost contact with the external agent throwing it. Once it loses contact, then the net force acting on it is only mg. Okay. It's always mg downwards everywhere till it hits the ground again. Then there is other force like contact force, etc. So 
so the net force acting on the pebble harshita always is equal to mg in magnitude and the direction is downwards hope the question is clear beta Okay, next we'll look at the twelfth question from H. C. Verma. Yeah, everywhere, na, beta. See, there is no other agent applying any force, na. So whether the stone is on the way up, on the way down, at the highest point, or it's in projectile motion, or whatever it is, na, the force acting on the stone is always invariant, na. It's only the weight. It's only the gravitational pull of the earth. So why should that change? There's no other agent applying any other force, na. No? That's why its acceleration is equal to g downwards, na. No? In kinematics, also you've seen that the acceleration is throughout these motions. The acceleration is constant, na. No? It's uniformly accelerated, minus g j k. So why this is happening? Because the net force is minus m g j k always. So there's nothing surprising about that, na. No? Okay, let's look at question number twelve in HCV. So here, what is happening is there is a person who is being lifted up from the ditch with the help of, you know, a rope, or you can say two ropes, or the same rope which has been, you know, bundled around his body or bound around his body, and is being pulled by. Two external agents over here. You're in this situation. Now one person is pulling from this side with some kind of force. Another person is pulling from this side with some kind of force. So you realize that if this is lift going up at a very slow speed, but going vertically upwards, these forces will have to be symmetric because on his body tension will have to act like this, which counterbalances his weight. and is going very slowly so he is going at acceleration almost tending to zero okay so if the angle of these two tensions with respect to the vertical is theta then on the person's free body diagram you can see that his weight and the two uniform tensions on either side they are acting like this okay this angle is theta so whatever force is being applied from both these sides that is equal to the tension on either rope or either side of the rope and 2t cos theta minus mg is just about tending to zero because the acceleration is tending to zero so tension is mg upon 2 cos theta okay and that's the same thing as the force So you can see that as he is going up, okay, theta will be increasing. So he is going from you know this position initially. So after some time he is at this position. So you can see that theta is increased now. So this this angle theta it's increasing as you're going up. So theta will increase means your tension or F will also increase. Sec theta, na, one by cos theta. 
so as theta increases sec theta also increases therefore the force increases as the person goes up the amount of force you have to apply to keep pulling him up will increase as he is coming further up okay and now numerically you want to calculate this so this distance was given to us as d okay and this is given to us as h so you can work out theta from the geometry of this triangle from the geometry of this triangle you can work out this theta this is d by 2 and this is h so sec theta will become square root of h square plus d square by 4 divided by h so you can substitute sec theta as like this the hypotenuse upon base so you can also write f as mg by 2 So here also you can see that as it goes up, h is decreasing. Therefore, that term now f is increasing because here the denominator is decreasing, so this term is increasing. Okay, people. So with that we conclude today's session. So. continue working on problems from hc verma try to cover up to at least question number 35 uh, in this week so that we can discuss your doubts okay so try to cover up to question 35 in hc week by end of week so that next lecture we can wind up the hc verma doubts then we also do some questions from the module but try to do this first So that's it for today's session people wish you all the best